and uh, welcome to this event. My name is, is Angel Salio. I'm an associate professor of Roman studies and the director of the Center for French and Francophone Studies at Duke University. Um, just some words on, on the organization, because this is in fact quite important. I'm going to give a brief introduction before Professor Ferrier's talks. And following uh, Michael Ferrier's presentation, we welcome questions from the audience. You can use the chat feature of Zoom to send your question after the talk. Please note that this event is being recorded, so please, um, you should all be muted, but uh, if there are problems with camera and micro that are suddenly on, please be discreet in this use. Um, and as always, before uh, we start, I would like to remind everyone that this online event, like all events organized by the center, are only made possible thanks to institutional support, including funding from the cultural services of the French Embassy in the United States and the Office of the Dean of Arts and Sciences at Duke University. As you know, today marks the 10th anniversary of an earthquake and tsunami that killed more than 18,000 people and triggered a nuclear meltdown in Fukushima. 10 years ago, on 11 March 2011, Japan's northeast coast was struck by a magnitude 9 earthquake, uh, 9.1, I think, to be more precise. 10 years on, more than 40,000 people are unable to return home, most of them from areas near Fukushima Daiichi, where the triple net down forced the immediate evacuation on 160,000 people the biggest exodus of population since World War II. While the plant's operator, Tokyo Electric Power, TEPCO, stabilized the damaged reactor at the end of 2011, work has barely begun to locate and remove melting, melted nuclear fuel, uh, a complex decommissioning operation that is expected to, less, to take at least 40 years and cost billions of dollars. TEPCO and the Japanese government has also um, to know what to do uh, with million tons of contaminated water being stored in more than 1,000 tanks on the site. Um, and we know that the capacity of those tanks will be fueled by the autumn 2022. Fukushima might then provide us uh, with, as Jean-Luc Nancy writes, the paradigm of our global catastrophe, and as such, has strong resonances with our current pandemic. It is also a catastrophe in which time is out of joints, as its temporality even defies the structures of our own rationality. What cannot say in face of such a disaster that seems even to, to radically deconstruct the conditions of possibility of our aesthetic regime, or rather, what else than art can articulate such a disaster? It is a great honor to be welcoming today Michael Ferrier to address some of those questions with, as a point of departure, a collective Franco-Japanese volume on artists who made the choice to think and create with Fukushima. Uh, this uh, volume is entitled Dans l'œil du désastre, créé avec Fukushima, which could be translated as the eye of the storm Art in the Time of Fukushima, It's just been published by Thierry Marchès in France. We can start to maybe explore today the consequences of the event called Fukushima on Franco-Japanese art, and furthermore, on, uh, furthermore, the role of art in the new configuration of our society after Fukushima. Professor Ferrier comes from a French family and has Mauritian Creole and Réunion Creole uh, roots. After a nomadic childhood in Africa and the Indian Ocean, he received his academic training in France. He is an alumnus of the Ecole Normale Supérieure. He holds an aggregation in literature and a doctorat d'état in literature from Paris University. He is currently professor at Chuo University, Tokyo, Japan, and director of the research group Figure de l'étranger in the face of alterity, uh, the image of the other in arts and society. Michael Ferrier has published several novels and essays um, and his interdisciplinary work in the field of literature, art, music and philosophy includes um, 
essays, on, uh, essay books on Japan, which have become a standard reference in the field. His first novel, Tokyo Petit Portrait de l'Aube, published by Gallimard in 2004, has been awarded the Prix Littéraire de l'Asie in 2005. His novel, Sympathie pour le Fantôme, published by Gallimard in 2010, portrays multiple voices, Ambroise Vollard, Jeanne Duval, and Edmond Albius, and embraces the contradiction and complexity of French national identity. It has been awarded the Prix Littéraire de la Porte Dorée, uh, which is a very interesting literary prize of the Cité Nationale de l'Histoire, uh, de l'Histoire de l'Immigration, de l'Histoire de l'Immigration, uh, the National French Museum of Immigration. He, is multiple, he has mis- written several works on Fukushima, and they know, we can say, constitute a major study on the earthquake, the tsunami and the nuclear accident. Um, this work has brought the interest of writers and philosophers like Jean-Luc Nancy, uh, who mentioned it in his essay, Fukushima, um, l'équivalence des catastrophes. Ferrier has been awarded the Prix Edouard Glissant in 2012. So please join me in welcoming Professor Ferrier uh, to uh, Duke's FFS today. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to thank you for your invitation. Uh, thank you to Duke University, of course, uh, the Office of the Dean of Arts and Sciences, the Cultural Services of the French Embassy in the US, and of course, many thanks to Professor Angel Salio who initiated this invitation. I am deeply honored to stand before you, or before this screen that is before you, and to share a little piece of my work. So uh, the topic today is art in the time of Fukushima. I will begin, I will try to share my screen now because I have got a PowerPoint. Mm, Just a minute, please. Okay. And I've forgotten to say that you're joining us from Tokyo. So it's in fact very late for you. Um, So we're connecting people (laughs) from Japan, France, and the US. Um, Yeah, we see your screen. See my screen, okay. Um, Try to, okay. So you will see. Yeah. All right. Is it all right for you? Okay. No problem. So uh, the topic today is uh, art in the time of Fukushima. And uh, the title is art in the time of Fukushima and not art after Fukushima or not uh, the post Fukushima art because as I explained many times before, uh, Fukushima is not finished. Uh, Fukushima is not over. There is still a huge amount of problems in Fukushima now, and that's the reason why I am reluctant to use the word after Fukushima. We are not in a post-Fukushima situation now. And uh, to some extent, we could say that the Fukushima disaster is not very far from its starting point. And that's the explanation of my title, not art after Fukushima, but art in the time of Fukushima. However, uh, as Angel Salio told you, uh, this is the 10th anniversary of the Fukushima disaster. And over the past 10 years, There have been a lot of studies on this triple disaster, the earthquake, the tsunami, and the nuclear disaster. And a huge, uh, wide range of uh, topics like uh, risk analysis, economic consequences, energetic consequences, political, ecological, public health, and so on. But there is one field that didn't receive the critical attention it deserves, and this field is the world of art. Uh, In 10 years, there have been, of course, there have been some case studies, some brief studies about some artists 
especially writers, but also photographers or, or painters. But there has been no major study to give, um, to give an overview about the world of contemporary art and especially visual artists. And this is quite a paradox because the impact of Fukushima has been very rapid and very effective on the world of art. So uh, I decided a long time ago, uh, eight years ago, to prepare a book about this topic. And uh, this book is now published. And this is Dans l'œil du désastre, uh, published by uh, Thierry Marchès uh, last month. So the first idea for this book was to provide not only eyesight, but a more global perspective on this phenomenon. And the second idea for this book was not only to write a book on Fukushima or on Fukushima's art or about Fukushima's art, uh, the idea was to listen, to listen to the artist. So this is a book with many, many interviews and to give the artist as much time as we could and the interviews uh, took place uh, from uh, 2014 to 2020, so six or seven years. And uh, we asked them many questions, of course, but also we let them talk. And uh, I thought that the artist had something to tell us about the disaster and even that they are among the best people able to respond effectively and to provide not only information, but also a deeper understanding of this phenomenon. So this is a long-term task, uh, six, seven years. This is a collective project, a collective work, a collective effort. And that is the reason why I would like to mention the names of the contributors. Uh, Hervé Couchot from the uh, University of Sofia in Tokyo. Uh, Amandine Davre, Amandine Davre is uh, in the uh, University of Montreal in Canada. Elise Domenac, who is in uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure in uh, Lyon in France. Uh, Benedict Goriot, University of Valenciennes in the north of France. And uh, Clélia Zernik, uh, who is teaching uh, Beaux Arts in, in the Beaux Arts in, in Paris. So this is a long term, a long term task. And this is a work on three continents, Europe with France, Asia with Japan, and, uh, and we in three languages, French, Japanese, and English. So I am going, the examples I am going to give you now are all taken from this book. And uh, to come right to the point, um, I will start with uh, Günther Anders. Uh, Günther Anders is a famous uh, philosopher. And Anders, a uh, long time ago, uh, after the Second World War, uh, coined a new word, uh, a new adjective. Uh, he calls this the supraliminar. Supraliminar, what is that? Supraliminar is uh, coming from two Latin words, supra, that means beyond, and limina, that means uh, limit, borders. And, uh, well, I will read uh, the definition of the supraliminar from Anders. I call supraliminar events and actions that are too great to be yet conceived by men between our capacity to produce and our ability to represent so this is a problem of representation. A massive gap is open, which is going to widen day by day. What is he talking about? Everybody here has heard about Adorno. Adorno uh, said after Auschwitz, after the Jewish genocide, poetry was not possible anymore. You cannot write a poem after Auschwitz. Uh, the idea of Anders is the same kind of ID, but not after Auschwitz, after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, Anders was, uh, had a kind of trauma after Hiroshima. And what he calls supraliminar is uh, the presence in our world 
of the nuclear power. The nuclear power is such a great power and it is such, uh, it, it is dealing with such amount of time, uh, million years, uh, that this cannot be represented. And look at the quotation uh, on the left side of the screen. Uh, this is the last quotation of Anders for today. Uh, Anders said, the, there are events of such importance that art cannot attain them. So art cannot represent something like a nuclear disaster. This is a point of view of Gunther Anders. And this is amazing. Why? Because uh, in the history of humanity, art has always been considered as the last refuge, the last shelter, the last place where uh, you could ex express something. But for Anders, with the atomic bomb on Hiroshima, this is over. Art cannot do anything to represent this terrifying experience of the nuclear disaster. So my, my point in this talk today is to think about this reflection of Günther Anders because I was in Japan in 2011, and, and I, I am still in Japan now, I'm talking from Tokyo. And from 2011, in fact, uh, many, many artists did some works about Fukushima. So um, I would like to make, to compare the reflection, the philosophical reflection of Ginter Anders with the practice, the artistic practice of many, many Japanese and French artists. So I will begin with one example. And this example, if I can slide on the next one here. Uh, what is that? This is a museum. This is a prefectural museum of Aichi. Aichi is near Nagoya in Japan. And you can see here a project for this museum in 2000. 13 from a Japanese architect named uh, Miyamoto Katsuhiro. Miyamoto Katsuhiro uh, designed uh, this project for the Triennale of Aichi, a very important event in the artistic world in Japan. And you can see a yellow, a yellow shape inside the building, inside the museum. And this yellow sh shape is the Fukushima nuclear plant. So uh, the project of Miyamoto for this uh, museum was to put inside the museum the huge nuclear plant of Fukushima. And he did it, he did it in, 19, in uh, 2013. Of course, it was not uh, the real nuclear plant that was uh, inside the museum, but you can see the yellow lines here that indicate the contour, the lines of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. And this is, I think this is a good example of the way that the Fukushima disaster, two years after Fukushima, two years af after 2011, two years after, the Fukushima disaster is overwhelming the museum. The Fukushima disaster is everywhere in the museum with the yellow lines. And this is not only a problem of space, this is also a problem of uh, history. Another project of uh, Katsuhiro, uh, of Miyamoto Katsuhiro, uh, is a shrine, a shrine inside the nuclear power plant, uh, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. In 2012, look at these four temples. In fact, the roof of the temples are on the reactors, the nuclear reactors. This is not a joke. This is a real project that Miyamoto Katsushiro designed for the, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. 
He wanted to build a shrine inside this area. Uh, he wanted to, to make clear that this area was like now like a sacred place, uh, something that has got to, to deal with religion. So you can see that uh, this topic of Fukushima disaster uh, has, has invaded every field of the society, of course, and every field of art, uh, architecture too. So uh, I will now go, come right to the point. Uh, what is the major change that Fukushima disaster has brought to the world of art? I call it a repoliticization. Uh, that means that there is a new political role for art in this context, in the Fukushima context. And I will take two examples, uh, Chimpom, that is a Japanese collective, and Takeuchi Kota. Uh, they call themselves art pe perpetrators. That means some artivist. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the plan of uh, what I'm going to explain today. But I will go directly to the point with the first example. The first example is Chimpom. Perhaps you have heard of Chimpom. Chimpom is now very famous all over the world. Uh, there are six people, one woman and five men, uh, quite young in their 20s and 30s. And um, they were already working on the nuclear topic before uh, Fukushima. And I will take the first example of, of uh, the artistic guerrilla of uh, Chimpom. In uh, 2008, what did they do? In the 2008, they rent a plane. This is a strange idea for artists. Uh, the six people from Ch Chimpom rented a plane and they went to Hiroshima. You can see here uh, the last trace of uh, the, the bombing of uh, Hiroshima with the famous Genbaku Dome. Uh, this is the last, uh, every, everybody knows the story, so I, I won't explain more precisely. And so Chimpom rented a, a plane and you can see uh, over the dome, you can see two uh, katakana, that means some uh, Japanese characters, that means pika. Pika is an onomatopoeia referring to the atomic blast, to the atomic flash. That means a big, big flash, uh, atomic flash. So this was before Fukushima in 2008, and they were already involved in this kind of, uh, of problem, in the nuclear problem. And then after Fukushima, they became very, very famous with a series of interventions, artistic inter interventions in the public space. And the first one was just one month after the disaster in April 2011. So just one month after Fukushima, after the explosion, the tsunami and the earthquake. And uh, this is an image of the video. They shot a video in the forbidden zone. So what did they do uh, on, this, on this day, on the April 11, 2011? First, they went to the forbidden zone wearing protective suits. So this is not, uh, this is not uh, Halloween. This is just in the real world, you know? And they, they designed a kind of sign with a red painting, as you can see here. <clears throat> and then this red painting, in fact, is the national flag of Japan that is called Hinomaru, that everybody knows this red circle in a white flag. But they transformed this flag in, they, they transformed the, the, the red circle with the symbol of the nuclear power that is uh, the radioactive, uh, I don't know how you call it in, uh, in, uh, in English, the radioactive tr trifle or something like that, um, and the symbol of the nuclear power. And so this symbol uh, 
combines the design of the war flag of the Imperial Japanese Army and the trefoil, the radiation, the radiation warning sim symbol to make this kind of symbol. That means that Japan, the, the heart of Japan, the cultural tradition of Japan, the national identity of Japan has been completely uh, invaded by the radioactivity. And then they climbed on a little hill about 600 meters from Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. You can see the Fukushima nuclear plant uh, just here. And they just moved the flag and they shot this video and they put the video on the internet and it was a big, 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 big uh, scandal. So this was the first kind of artistic action of Chimpom after, after March 11. The second one is uh, in uh, Shibuya in Tokyo uh, in 2011. And this, this is a painting. <clears throat> As you can see, this is a kind of very strange painting with uh, two uh, blue reactors, the central uh, the nuclear reactors. Here's some kind of red eyes and so on. So perhaps you can say, but that's not very beautiful. But the problem is not it's not beautiful. The problem is, the point is, where did they put that? They went here, they went in Shibuya. If you, are, uh, if you have been in Tokyo already, you know the Shibuya station. This is one of the most gigantic uh, stations in the world, and of course in Tokyo. And a lot of people are passing by in this place, and they are, they are just walking, and they are walking in front of this huge painting of Okamoto Taro. Okamoto Taro is a famous Japanese painter and the painting in Shibuya is called uh, The Myth of Tomorrow, Asu, Asu no Shinwa. It has been painted in 1968 and 69. And uh, what did Chimpom do? Look at this painting. This painting has been painted by Okamoto Taro uh, after a very famous accident uh, in 1954. In 1954, there was a big, big nuclear test by American army uh, in Bikini. And this test was too big. And so a lot of uh, fishing boats have been contaminated by the nuclear test of the American army. And this made a very big scandal. There has been one people uh, dead and fishermen and radioactive fish for two or three months in Japan. And Okamoto Taro um, is referring to this accident in his painting. But look precisely at this painting. You can see the escalator here in front of the painting. And the two people here are the people of Chimpom. And what are they doing? They are putting their own painting on the painting of Okamoto Taro. So they are, they are adding something. They are adding a painting to an existent, pre-existent painting in Shibuya Station. And look at, the, look at the right side of your screen and you will see the, the red arrows, there was an empty space here. And in this empty space, Chimpom put its own painting, like to complete the Okamoto Taro painting. Of course, this painting has been removed one hour later by the Japanese police. And this was, uh, one more time, this was a big scandal because this is just in the earth of Tokyo. So the, the aim of Chimpom was to make a denunciation, to denounce the hypocrisy of the Japanese people. Every day, every people, every Japanese people passing by this big painting of Okamoto Taro, but the nuclear world is uh, going over and over and the nuclear business has not stopped uh, since Fukushima. This was the, the aim, the of Chimpom. And another, another artistic work of Chimpom was a radioactive, a radioactive ikebana. Ikebana is a uh, flower arrangement. 
and they put it in a gallery. They worked in collaboration with a famous, famous Ikebana master whose name, whose name is Kakizaki Junichi. And they let it in the gallery for many, many days and the radioactive flowers uh, decayed. And at the end of the exhibition, it was <coughs> a radioactive rotten, a, rat, a rotten radioactive Ikebana. Uh, and last example, one of the Chimpom's members uh, was hired in the Fukushima nuclear plant and he took this picture, putting a red card on the nuclear reactor. So this is a kind of action that um, the people from Chip Chimpom is doing. This is a, a artistic action, artistic interventions in the public space. Another example is Takeuchi Kota, and perhaps you have already seen this video that is very famous. And this video uh, is, uh, you can see it on, uh, on YouTube. Uh, this is a main a worker in Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant, and he's pointing a finger at the camera on the side. Uh, you can see here, I, I, we are not going to watch all the video, of course, it's, it's uh, like 15 minutes, but we can see the beginning of this video. So you can see this worker in a radio protective suit is uh, holding a camera in his hands and then is approaching from another camera that is a TEPCO camera. On, and you can see behind this main, behind this worker, you can see the nuclear the nuclear plant, and then he's going to uh, shot his movie, his video, and he's going to do this famous act of pointing a finger at the camera. And everybody said, but what is he doing? And you see his right hand. And now he will stand like this for about uh, 10 minutes, a little bit more of 10 minutes, just like this. And uh, the, the video is very famous. And, and many people said, but what is that? Is that art? Uh, is it just a political action of some, someone who is uh, pointing a finger at the camera, but also pointing a finger, a finger at the nuclear industry? And many people said, that is not art. That is just a political political act. But we are in the hurt, in the hurt of our topic, because in fact, uh, as I will tell you now, just a minute, this finger pointing worker is not only a political heart, because it is an, an allusion to another artistic performance by Vito Akanshi, 40 years before, Vito Akanshi in New York did exactly the same gesture for 10 minutes, around 10 minutes, in front of a camera. At this time, in 1971, uh, Vito Akanshi wanted to make people think about the power of the camera, the power of the image, the power of television. And you can see that the finger-pointing worker of Takeuchi Kota is doing exactly the same gesture, but in a very different context. So all these artistic actions, in fact, uh, are, are uh, they are in the field of what we can call the artivism. That means art as an activism. So the problem is not the question, is it art? Is it beautiful? Is it not beautiful? Is it really art? But the problem is, is it relevant? Is it efficient? And it is a conception of art that thinks about art as an act. And what I want to explain here is that this kind of chimpom or kotata keuchi actions are, have been bringing a breath of fresh air through the contemporary art market. And you must remember that at this time, what was the contemporary world of art? in 1911. In fact, perhaps you don't remember this, but it was things like this. 
In 2011, the art, the world of art in Japan and not only in Japan, was completely dominated by, the, by this kind of works. I take the, the example of Murakami Takashi. Murakami Takashi is an excellent artist. Uh, he has got a PhD in Nihonga. Nihonga is a traditional Japanese painting. But at this time, in 2005, so before Fukushima, uh, art was considered like this. That means that you had a lot of very vivid anime figures, a lot of flowers, and of course, art was seen as a financial product with many, many sales of products derived from art and more important than art itself. You can see here the Takashi Murakami uh, mug black, the Takashi Murakami uh, mug with a flower, and of course, not only mugs, but t-shirts, Takashi Murakami flower Chicago, Takashi Murakami flower Los Angeles, and so on and so on. And don't ask me why the Chicago t-shirt is less expensive than the Los Angeles t-shirt. I don't know, but nobody knows. This was just art as business. And art was also connected with, connected with fashion. You have here a very famous uh, Vuitton bag, uh, always from Murakami. Uh, it cost a lot of money, of course. And art was also a kind of advertising campaign, as you can see with the collaboration in 2007 of uh, Murakami Takashi with uh, Kanye West on the, the cover artwork for graduation. So art was considered for the commercial exploitation, uh, Asobi system, you can see here, Asobi system. Asobi means uh, to have fun. In, uh, in Japanese. And it was also a political explo exploitation by the Japanese government. You can see also uh, right to the Asobi system, the Cool Japan TV. Cool Japan was a soft power of Japan on the international scene, thanks to the contemporary art. And this is not over, we are 10 years after Fukushima, but now you can see that this is not over at all because this is a very powerful and very rich system. And uh, now we are in the COVID-19 era. Uh, the system adapted, the adaptation of the system, and you can see a mask, uh, quite expensive, $11, but you got two models for adult and for child and two filters. So this is not over. And then you can understand why uh, the, this world, this world of the contemporary art before Fukushima uh, has been completely disturbed by the Fukushima disaster and by the new wave of young Japanese artists that came and that completely um, put a mess in this kind of very, very well organized uh, financial system. And this is not only Murakami Takashi, uh, these are the three musketeers of the contemporary art at this time. Jeff Koons, of course, Murakami Takashi, and Damien Arst, the British. And you can see, I, I took the pictures um, randomly on the internet. You can see that even in the, the gestures, the smiles, this was a kind of self-branding. And uh, this was an, um, this was a combinate between political exploitation by the Japanese government or by others' government, the software, the software power, and of course, financial uh, exploitation. Uh, art was, and art is still a, a financial product, a marketing product. And now Murakami Takeshi has changed a little bit, and you can see uh, he has changed, even his, uh, his body has changed and his, uh, his way of dressing has changed. He's now in not a very colorful uh, clothes, but uh, white, uh, black, uh, black suits. But I will talk perhaps uh, about Murakami Takeshi after, if you have questions. <clears throat> but I wanted to, to show you that the new wave of Japanese artists uh, after Fukushima 
has, has brought something really new and really um, a, a political point of view that was not uh, the political point of view of the financial market art uh, before. Of course, this is a more spectacular, but there are, uh, I will go a little bit further now with uh, two more examples of people who are less politically involved, less politically engaged, but two great artists uh, that changed their practice of art after Fukushima. And I will take two examples, Kawakubo Yoi and Omake Shinji. Uh, Kawakubo Yoi is a Japanese artist, of course, uh, he's born in 1979 and uh, he's born in Toledo in Spain and he lives between Spain and Japan. And before Fukushima in 2011, but this is a picture before Fukushima, uh, he was making some pictures of the waterfronts in Japan, you know, Japan is an island, so there are beautiful shores and beautiful, the beautiful sea, like here in Mitsukejima. And you can see the picture before Fukushima. The picture was very, very clear. The technical is perfect. And I can give you another example. In 2009, Kawakubo Yoi did this kind of pictures. This is a photography with geometric lines. And even sometimes, this is also a, uh, a photography. And in this picture, it's, it looks like a painting, in fact, like an abstract painting. So you have these very, very good pictures, very aesthetic, uh, very stylish. And this is before Fukushima. And after Fukushima, uh, two changes. The first change, suddenly uh, Kawakubo, Yoi, Kawakubo Yoi decided to insert in his pictures the Fukushima uh, nuclear plants, but not only the Fukushima nuclear plants, but all the nuclear plants in the world. So this is this new project, the nuclear age. And you can see that the picture is more realistic and you have some cars that have been brought here by the tsunami. Another example after Fukushima is the Tsuruga nuclear plant. So the topic has changed. This is still uh, the waterfront because you know the nuclear plants need a lot of water to cool, to refresh the reactors. But now the, the, the colors have changed too. And it is a not so clear, it is a little, bit, a little bit blurred. And you can see a third example. This is a Fukushima Daini nuclear plant. The color is a little bit frightening with this uh, green, the red spots, and the kind of halo that is invading the center of the image. So I look at this, you can see the comparison before and after Fukushima, the artistic treatment of the picture has changed a lot. And the technical maestria of Kawakubo is, is amazing. He's really a great artist, but his way of taking pictures has, has changed, not only in the topic, but in the, in the technique itself. The second example is Omaki Shinji. Omaki Shinji is uh, born in 1971 in Gifu. And uh, since Fukushima, he left Tokyo. Many, many Japanese artists uh, changed their life, their personal life uh, after Fukushima. And uh, for example, Omaki left Tokyo to Miura Kaigan, that is two hours from Tokyo, uh, near the sea in a fisherman uh, village. And he built his own uh, house in this village. And uh, before Fukushima, this is the kind of work that uh, Omaki Shinji did. Uh, you're looking at a room. This is a big room, a big white room. And um, there is some crystal powder, some whiteout. 
there is some carpet. And so the spectator is entering the room and is uh, in a kind of a white room, very bright. And you can see the title. The title is Echoes Crystallization, Happiness in Everyday Life in 2008. And what is very interesting, this is 2008. But after Fukushima, uh, Omaki Shinji did the same kind of art, the same kind of work, but first he changes the title. The title is no more Echoes Crystallization, but Echoes Recrystallization in 2012. And there is still some crystal powder, there's still some whiteouts, there is still some marble, but the motives have changed and there are now flower motives. And these flower motives are endangered species. That means that uh, the practice and the thinking of Omaki Shinji has changed and he has integrated the ecological point of view in his work. You can see it with this picture, this work of art. This is also a white room with uh, white lamps and uh, you got a, a little girl in a red dress in the center of the room. This is called Garden for Children in 2010. But after Fukushima, two years after, you have still a little girl, but this is not a white room anymore. This is a uh, work called black weight, black weight. So something black has come, something that is very heavy on the shoulders of this young girl, of this little girl, like a burden. These are uh, big nylon strings in the center of a room. And this, if you can see one day, perhaps you will see this work of art uh, somewhere. And you will be amazed, I think, because this is a very powerful, a very impressive work of art. And that is the reason why uh, we, change, we, we choose this art, uh, uh, this work for our cover. And you can see clearly the difference here between the two pictures and the two works. So these are two examples of some changes in the practices in the topics but not only in the topics in the in the artistic treatments in the works of two major japanese artists i will now give uh, uh, more examples especially in uh, photography and uh, a new range of techniques and i will um, come to the problem of the invisibility that is a very very essential problem uh, for uh, radioactivity as you know a radioactivity you cannot see it you cannot feel it you cannot touch it and uh, i will take first the example of uh, minato chihiro minato chihiro is uh, 60 years old he is a very very famous japanese photographer uh, he has been the curator of many exhibitions. He's teaching in Geidai, the University of Arts in Tokyo. And he, he has been the responsible for the Japanese pavilion in the Biennale of Venice in 2007, uh, if I remember. And so he, he is a very respected artist, a very respected photographer. But in one of our, of our interviews, uh, he told me uh, what we must learn to do now um, with the Fukushima disaster, we've, we must learn to fail. And he told me that I must learn to fail my picture, to fail my photography. This was very amazing for me because he is a very respected photographer. He can, he can make very, very beautiful pictures. But the pictures that Minato took uh, in the Forbidden Zone or in the Fukushima area, uh, you have an example here. Look at this picture. This is a picture in front of the city hall of Itatemura. Itatemura is a, is a village, a town, and uh, that has been contaminated by the radioactive contamination. And look at, at this picture. This is a very simple picture, black and white. And uh, on the right side, you have a stone with something written in Japanese characters, uh, a poem or an historical explanation. 
On the left side, you have a, a sculpture. We are in front of the city hall, a Japanese sculpture. But in the front, in the middle of the picture, you got a dosimeter. A dosimeter is a radioactive device, not a radioactive device, but measuring, a device measuring the radioactivity. Here you have five microsieverts. So this is a very simple, a very plain picture. And this is not a very interesting picture in itself, but it shows something. It shows that now in the, in the Fukushima area and in the Fukushima time, the, the essential topic is not the stone with the poem anymore. It is not the sculpture anymore. It is not the right side, it is not the left side. Now, the, the central topic is the dosimeter. And we have a second example on a second photography of Minato Chihiro. This is Yonomori Station in 2019 for the restart of the Joban line. What do you see on this picture? You can see first, on the right side, uh, the platform numbers. Of course, we are inside a station. So you have the platform number one for Iwaki and Mito, the platform number two for Haranomachi and Sendai. And look at the, at the left side. Uh, you are waiting for a clock, of course, but this is not a clock. This is a dosimeter. So this is a very, very simple picture, but this picture shows a lot of things. First, this picture shows that we have entered a universe of figures, a universe of calculations, a universe of measures. We are measuring radioactivity everywhere in the area. This is the first thing that this picture shows. The second thing is that you were waiting for a clock, but this is not a clock, this is a dosimeter. That means that we have entered the Fukushima time, the radiation time. Now everything in this area, everything in this world is submitted to the radiation threat. So I gave you two examples of these pictures of these failures of uh, uh, Minato. He calls this failed photography. Uh, failed pictures, but these pictures uh, are perhaps not beautiful, but they are very expressive. They learn, they teach us a lot of things. This is the example of uh, Minato Chihiro. Uh, another example is Marc Palin, Hélène Lucien, they are French, Kawako Boyoi again, and Takeda Shimpei. Uh, this, this is a, also a very important point. Uh, these three artists don't know each other. They are complete strangers to each other, these four artists. Marc Palin and Hélène Lucien, of course, are together, but they didn't know Kawako Boyoi and they didn't know Takeda Shimpei. And these four people had exactly the same ID after Fukushima. Their ID is to go into the landscapes of contamination. You can see here Hélène Lucien and they put into the contaminated soil, into the contaminated ground, they put some, uh, some sheets or some films, some negatives, and they put some radiography and they waited for some time. And then you got some, I don't know if you can say work of art, but you got this kind of pictures that has been presented as works of art. This is Marc Palin and Hélène Lucien, but Kawaku Boyoi did exactly the same thing. Not exactly, but uh, he did the same kind of operation and he had very different results. You can see he had some colors, more colorful results in his series of uh, Southern Suns. And a third people, Japanese one, Takeda Shimpei. He has, uh, I will explain perhaps after in the questions or, uh, and answers. He has a slightly different way of doing this, but the, the principle is always to put in the contaminated soil, some kind of film, some kind of photographic film 
here in plastic sleeve. And uh, the Takeda Shinpei's works are called traces. This is a traces, trace number nine in a shrine. And you can see the little white dots. This is the radioactive contamination. And of course, if we put it in a dam, like the Mano Dam uh, near Lake Ayama, you got a, a, a very different uh, work. You got a very different picture. And this is interesting. Why? Because one of the one of the major problems now in Fukushima area is not only to measure radioactivity, but to make it uh, visible for some ordinary people. Uh, to make visible the radioactivity and the danger. In this place, you have a danger. In this place, you have a hotspot. How are you going to deal with that? You can deal with this kind of works. So this is a new, collection, a new collaboration between art and science. Uh, there is an internet site, a Mina no Data Site. Mina no Data Site is a website where you have this kind of uh, map of uh, radioactive, here it is cesium, uh, radioactive contamination. Uh, this is a projection uh, over uh, 100 years. So uh, this is a potential connection between the world of art and the world of science. And this is a very, very new way and a very interesting one. Not so new perhaps because as you know, uh, a famous uh, movie maker, Kurosawa Akira, already thought about this in his uh, movie Dreams. Uh, in his movie Dreams, it is a series of dreams. Uh, Kurosawa uh, imagined a nuclear explosion on the Fujisan, on the, on the Mount Fuji. And the problem for Kurosawa at this time was how to represent the radioactivity. And Kurosawa uh, chose the color and dreams is a very colorful movie and especially uh, this dream uh, with the mount fuji and the nuclear and the nuclear explosion on the mount fuji so this is uh, this is a very interesting uh, way for uh, the future the new collaboration between art and science and i will finish today with the last example that is a this, uh, this main, uh, whose name is Arai Takashi. Uh, Arai Takashi is born in 1978 in Kawasaki. And Arai Takashi is, uh, is a very gifted, uh, talented artist. I think this is one of the best artists of his generation, I think. And I will just show you some, uh, some pictures uh, of Arai Takashi. And Arai Takashi is making some daguerreotypes. Uh, you know, the daguerreotypes is, uh, daguerreotype is born in 1835, if I quite remember, in the 19th century. And this is a kind of ancestor of photography. And uh, so this is a very amazing, uh, amazing idea of uh, Arai Takashi to document the Fukushima, the Fukushima disaster with daguerreotypes, because Fukushima disaster is something very actual, very new with the nuclear technology, and is documenting this not with new technologies, but with a very ancient one, the daguerreotype. And is making a lot of daguerreotypes. Here you got the Trinity site, where there had been the first atomic bomb in 1945. You know this one, of course. This is the Daigo Fukuryu Maru, the lucky dragon number five, the fish boat that uh, we were talking about before uh, with the uh, Okamoto Taro's uh, painting in Shibuya. And these are nine daguerreotypes. And this is the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plants. As you can see, we have evolved from this one with a halo, and then this one, nine daguerreotypes. And this one, I don't remember the exact number of daguerreotypes here, but you can see that there are a lot of daguerreotypes. So this, this is a, a visual image of the fragmentation that the nuclear industry is bringing into our world. And uh, uh, Arashi, uh, Akai, Arai Takashi, so, uh, excuse me, Arai Takashi is, uh, 
playing or dealing with this kind of puzzle. It documents the puzzling situation, the confusing situation we are in now in our nuclear world. Uh, Arai Takashi is not only uh, taking pictures of landscapes like this or, uh, or some objects like uh, the famous fishing boat. He is also making some portraits. Here, here are some radioactive lilies in Itate village, Itate Mura. Here is a radioactive dog. Here are some farmers at the decontamination site. And what you can see is that every time that he is uh, making a work about the nuclear object or the nuclear plants, it is a puzzle. But every time he every time is making a portrait, there are there is only one daguerreotype. And is also making portraits, very beautiful portraits like this one. This young guy of uh, 17 years old, born in Hiroshima. And he asks them to, he asks them to say something. And so this is not only the daguerreotype, there is also a, uh, some sound, some uh, some words. This is Nobuyasu, born in uh, Iwaki in Fukushima Prefecture, and these are Myra and Leona, two sisters, twin sisters, I, as you can see. So these daguerreotypes are not only beautiful, of course, <clears throat> but <clears throat> they are very disturbing. I think they are very disturbing because. First, you, you have a work of memory. <clears throat> I mean that uh, Arai is, is expressing the history of the radioactive <clears throat> contamination and the radioactive accidents, not only Fukushima, but before the other accidents or the other problems. So there is a work of memory, but this is very disturbing because you got, for example, this nuclear plant it looks like an old, very old plant, but on the contrary, this kind of portrait looks very vivid and very new, very beautiful. And the daguerreotypes is a very ancient technique, but it, it gives us very clear, very clear lines and very beautiful faces. And on the contrary, when you see the nuclear plant, here is the Rancho Seco nuclear plant, you can see a kind of very, very old, obsolete uh, plant. So Arai is uh, dealing with the notions of the ancient, what is ancient, what is new, what is modern, what is archaic, and he's, he's, he's making this kind of a very disturbing uh, interconnection between uh, the past, the future, the present. And I, I will finish with this daguerreotype. It's uh, Koyu Abe, he is a Buddhist priest in Fukushima prefecture. And he is in his private, uh, on his private property in his garden. And you can see the radioactive waste and look at the, the left hand of Koyu Abesan, he is like he's trying to tame the radioactive waste. All these people, as you can see, all these people are standing. They are standing. They are in a state of resistance. They are alone or two or three people. They are working. They are waiting. They are looking at you. They are standing still and very, very strong and very fragile at the same time. And this, this last daguerreotype is, is very impressive and very beautiful, I think. So uh, my conclusion, uh, uh, we have talked about the invisibility problem. The invisibility is a kind now of stereotype when you talk about the Fukushima's art. Uh, because everybody says the invisibility is uh, the main problem of the radioactivity. How make visible something that is invisible? 
And I remember a book from Ralph Ellison that everybody knows, of course, and this quotation, I am invisible in the stand simply because people refuse to see me. Uh, I want to make the connection between the race problem, the race issue, of course, and the nuclear problem. But you will do it yourself if you want. But the problem of invisibility is that invisibility is not always where you expect it is. And this problem of invisibility uh, is, uh, made me think about one, uh, not only about this famous book from Ralph Ellison, but about this famous movie of James Whale, The Invisible Man, the same title, almost the same title. On the left side, you have the Fukushima liquidator. On the right side, you have uh, the, the image, uh, the French image of the movie. And this is quite amazing because you got something that is visually stunning. The Chernobyl liquidators in 2011 look like invisible men. And in fact, they were made invisible. And this picture is not a picture of a liquidator. This picture has been taken in the Fukushima area. This woman, this is a woman, she's waiting behind the glass in a radio protective suit with a mask. This is not because of the COVID-19. This is because her daughter, her daughter is being scanned for uh, radioactive contamination uh, in the other part of the room. So, as you can see in Japanese, you have uh, kokoyori kinshi. Kokoyori kinshi means uh, you cannot enter here. That means that um, uh, we are becoming invisible. The problem is not that the radiations or the radioactive contamination is invisible. The problem is, I think, that the human being themselves are becoming in more and more invisible in this new era of radioactive contamination that is taking place more and more on the planet. And if you remember the story, the plot of the, um, <coughs> of the, um, the movie of uh, James Whale, The Invisible Man, this is a story of a man, uh, a very famous scientist. And this very famous scientist uh, finds a way to become invisible and is very clever, is very talented, is a great scientist, but what he forgot is that uh, you cannot reverse the process. The process of invisibility is not reversible and it has a lot of side effects. And one of the side effects is to make people crazy. And you can see on this GIF on the, on the screen, uh, we'll begin with a reign of terror, a few murders here and there. And this reign of terror, perhaps, can be uh, the reign of the atomic era. These few murders have begun because there are a few, uh, not only a few, but there are a lot of victims of the atomic uh, era now, not only uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, not only the Daigo Fukuyumaru, the fishing boat, not only the people from Chernobyl, not only uh, the people from Fukushima. So uh, the problem is not that the radiations are invisible. The problem is that we have entered a state of invisibility for the human beings themselves. And as you know, the task of the artist perhaps is to make this invisibility visible. This is perhaps the real invisibility and this is perhaps the last, the last chance to avoid a real reign of terror on our planet. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, for, for this very rich talk. And, and, I, and I really also I'm very aware that you're talking in the middle of the night for you. <laughs> um, so uh, thank you. It's, it's really uh, you know, appreciated that you're making such an effort as well. Um, I would like to welcome questions from the audience. Um, and I know I have students who are taking a class <laughs> who might have specific questions. I know it's running a bit late for them, but if they could just um, signal in the chat their questions, and I would be uh, happy to take them. Otherwise, I could open the questioning. But 
Has anyone got any question? Okay, um, I will start so then. You are not on me invisible, you are mute. <laughs> Yes, they are muted. I know they are invisible and muted. Um, we can, you know, <laughs> of course, if someone has a question, I will unmute them and put the video on. Uh, but it's, you know, one of the constraints we have. Yeah, okay, so David Houston has, uh, so I'm going to unmute him. Yeah, perfect. You can ask your question directly. Yeah, thanks very much. That was a fascinating talk. Um, I just have a question about failure in relation to the photographer you mentioned who you said was referring to the need to fail. It, for me, it resonates with Samuel Beckett. I was just wondering whether that was a connection that you had made, whether you think that is a productive connection to make in this context. I didn't think about Samuel Beckett, but you know, Samuel Beckett is such a wonderful writer that you can connect it to a lot of problems and a lot of issues. But what is interesting in my mind with um, Minato, Minato Sanno art of failure, uh, I repeat that he is really a very good photographer, but what he tries to make he tries to make us understand that we are failing. The human beings, mankind is always failing. The failure is constitutive of mankind. And this is very interesting if you compare it with the, the story of the atomic power, because uh, this is a fantastic story. The atomic saga, the atomic story, uh, the scientific were among the, not among, they were the best scientific in the world. The people who invented the, the atomic bomb, not only the atomic bomb, but the, the, uh, the nuclear industry, they were very clever. They were the best, the best thinkers. And this energy, the nuclear energy, has brought many, many good points, many good aspects to humanity, especially uh, in medicine, medicine or radiography, and, uh, and even in energy, energetic needs of, uh, of the towns of the people. But Minato says that we have reached some point where this progress is not going to make us happy anymore. So we have to think about it and we have to remind that we can fail and we failed a lot of times with atomic world, you know. Last time was Fukushima, but uh, before Fukushima there was Chernobyl and uh, the next one, I don't know. I, uh, I, but there are still some risk because you know, the nuclear plants are plants though so they are getting old. And the more they are getting old and the more they are getting dangerous, everybody knows that. So I don't know if we can make a relation with uh, Samuel Beckett, but uh, if I remember- I Maybe I read Beckett. thinking of a specific citation by Beckett in which he says the condition of the artist is to fail. Am I correct? That what you, what you were thinking of? I was thinking of that, but also the comment about the need to fail again, fail better. Yes, yeah. fail again, fail better, yes. Yeah. And you know that one of the books of uh, Beckett is, uh, the title is, if I quite remember, the title is Catastrophe, a little, little text, very interesting. Uh, Thank you. You're welcome. I think I, I will ask a question because I think my students are too shy or too intimidated to be asking questions. Uh, but when I, uh, when I, 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 um, I in fact schedule this talk, I had one question from one student, which I think was quite pertinent is, why my call is on France Asie? Why are, you, are we going to talk about Fukushima? It's something that happened in Japan and I, the students was unable to identify the French connection. 
And the book you've just published is really Franco-Japanese. It's a Franco-Japanese dialogue. And I think maybe you could speak a bit more about the ways in which the question of the atomic um, power uh, has very strong resonances in France and why, in fact, many French artists have tackled the issue of trying to give visibility to Fukushima. Um, and just talking about you know, the political dimension of all these um, uh, artistic acts you've been talking about, uh, why this has just strong resonance in France, I think would be very interesting for, for the audience. Um, yes, the, the answer is quite simple. Um, there are three countries in the world uh, there are more countries that got the, the atomic power, of course, but historically there are three countries very, very important for the atomic power. These are um, is the United States. And you know that the United States had a meltdown, not a meltdown, but if I quite remember, uh, it was very close to a meltdown. And this was the first one, I think, if I remember, this was in 1978. And I don't remember the name of this nuclear plant, but you, you, you should remember this. This was the first, this was before Chernobyl. Chernobyl. And uh, the, the France is a very, very important country for uh, the nuclear industry because you got many reactors, I think, 54, if I'm exact, but uh, the problem of France is that it's a very, very small country with a lot of reactors on it. So this is um, because United States of America is very large, it's very wide. And so you have many, many reactors, but the country itself is very, very large. In France, we have a very small country with a lot of reactors like um, like the, the threat is more is more like a lot of dots on the map, you know, and Japan is is a very special country for nuclear power because it is the only country to have received some nuclear bombs two times in Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the only country to have received the bombs and to have uh, to have uh, had a, a nuclear disaster in Fukushima in, in 2011. So uh, after 2011, uh, the French artists, the French writers especially, um, of course, they felt, uh, they felt concerned by this problem. And I am a Frenchman living in Tokyo for now 30 years. So um, I, I did this book with a Japanese team and a French team. And this is, this is not by chance. This is, of course, French people feel concerned by this. Japanese people are concerned too. And um, I wanted to insert some American artists because there are, there are some American artists uh, and European artists who work about uh, not only about Fukushima but about the nuclear issues in art, and but I didn't have time, and this is also a question of uh, opportunity, you know. So I think uh, if I want to answer to your question, the French-Japanese connection is very logical in this in this field, in this nuclear field. If you have some uh, some time, I recommend to to watch a movie. Uh, from uh, Watanabe Kenichi. Uh, Watanabe Kenichi is a Japanese uh, movie maker, a documentarist, and he's living in France. And uh, he made a movie about the history of plutonium. And in this movie, this is called the Nuclear Lands, a history of plutonium. Uh, this movie is, is very interesting because it, it, it reveals the similarities between the three countries of this triangle, uh, France, Japan, and United States. And for the business, for the plutonium, plutonium business, these three countries are very, very, very important. Nuclear lands, 
history of plutonium by Watanabe Kenichi. And I precise that I wrote this, I wrote this movie, of course. And so I am, I am uh, in the process of this movie too. Thank you very much. I think that was a very uh, comprehensive answer. We have questions from my students, which I would like to take because they might have to run to other classes. So Ali Sadek is asking, do you believe that nuclear plants everywhere should be phased out? And do you think this is feasible? <laughs> this is a, a big question for you, <laughs> Michael. Uh, I don't know if it is feasible, but what I can say is that and I am not alone to say that, and many artists say that. Uh, I, I will take the example of uh, Suwa Nobushiro. Suwa Nobushiro is a Japanese movie maker. And uh, in his interview, he told us a very simple sentence. He just said, you know, I am a movie maker. So I, I make some movies, I make some images. But why we should try he gave this interview to Elise Domenac uh, in the book and he finished the interview and he said, um, we should learn to see the world in a different way. The problem is not to, to, to think, is it feasible or is it not feasible? The problem is to look at the way we are treating our world today. Because the nuclear problem is not only a nuclear problem. The problem is more wide. The problem is our relation to the living people, our relation to our planet, our relation to the trees, to the animals, to, to ourselves. And so we cannot go on like this. Uh, we must learn a new way to look at our planet and to interact with our planet because we are a part of it. Uh, you talked about Edouard Glissant a little bit uh, earlier. Uh, this is, uh, Glissant was saying that the problem is to change the imaginaries. That means not only the images, but to change our way to see the problems. If you, if, if you say, okay, this is not feasible, we, we, have, to, we have to live with this energy, uh, with the nuclear energy, you won't get rid of it, of course, because from the starting point, you decided that it is not feasible. But if it is not feasible, you have to do it. That's the point. And, uh, so we need a change in our way to see the world. And that's why the artistic, the works of art are so important because artists are not simply reproducing the, the reality. They are just changing our, our way to see the reality. So if it is not feasible, that's not, a, that's not a problem. We have to do it. And I have other question. One is from Katie Tsai, and she's asking, what were the reactions of Fukushima residents to the art you included in this presentation? Were they supportive or critical? Um, did they feel? Uh, this is a very inter inter interesting question. Uh, first, uh, I talked about artivist, you know, art as an act. And the artists uh, that are dealing with the Fukushima, that are interested in Fukushima, they are trying, for many of them, they are trying to work with the inhabitants of Fukushima. They are organizing festivals, they are organizing ateliers, they are organizing some concerts, music concerts. Minato Chihiro, for example, was in Fukushima uh, one week ago. These people are going and, uh, in Fukushima every time uh, as much as possible. So, uh, the, the, and Arai Takashi is working a lot with the people of Fukushima, Fukushima Prefecture. And so, the people of Fukushima of course are grateful because these artists uh, make the, their situation visible. So they are supportive, but there is, there is also another part of the population that is a little bit fed up with the, the image of a radioactive Fukushima. 
and so the the situation is a little bit a little bit mixed. Uh, some people of the Fukushima prefecture are fed up, really fed up, because Fukushima has become a synonym of radioactive. So, for example, if you are a fisherman or uh, uh, someone who is selling some fruits or vegetables from Fukushima, you've got this like a stigma. You got it like a, your, your vegetables, even if they are safe, they are from Fukushima. So uh, this is a kind of doom on Fukushima. So some people are fed up. Uh, some people don't want uh, some other people to talk about the radioactive problem anymore, but the artists uh, are quite welcome uh, nowadays uh, in Fukushima too. And this is very instructive because the, the Fukushima disaster, the nuclear catastrophe, the nuclear disaster has done a very a fragmentation, a fragmentation of the country, a fragmentation of the landscape because some zones are forbidden some zones you cannot go here, you cannot enter. And not only a fragmentation of the landscape, but also a fragmentation of the population between old and young, between uh, businessmen and uh, fishermen. And so this is the fragmentation. You remember the Arai Takashi daguerreotypes with a lot of daguerreotypes. Uh, this is an image of the puzzle. For example, take an example in France. If you have a nuclear accident in France, you will have exactly the same fragmentation. That means um, the atomic energy is fragmenting, fragmentating, making some fragmentation of the atoms to, to generate the energy, but not only of the atoms. It generates a, a general fragmentation of the landscapes, of the habits, of the ways of living, and so on and so on. Thank you. And there is one another question from Gabriel Richard, who is asking if you could see a connection uh, between the video in which you have the artist pointing a finger and John, uh, John Cage 433, in which musicians come on the stage and don't play. For four minutes and thirty-three seconds. This uh, is, yes, this is also a very interesting question. In in the book, I didn't speak about the music because we cannot uh, we cannot uh, take all the topics. But the music, uh, the musicians did a lot uh, to uh, with the Fukushima art, and uh, the the example of John Cage is very interesting because there is a Japanese artist. Uh, his name is uh, Yamakawa Fukui, I think, and he's making some uh, radioactive concerts. Uh, and uh, perhaps I can show you this, just a minute. Yes, I prepared some, this is a technical. Um, what is that? Just a minute, I will find it. Yes, this, this main. This man is uh, making some performances, artistic and musical performances. And after Fukushima, he decided to make a radioactive concert. So this is the scene with two uh, guitars, two Fender guitars, Stratocaster, very good guitars, one on the right, one on the left. You got some dosimeters here. And uh, look under the guitar. Under the guitar, you got a mic here on the left, on the right, and you got a kind of ashtray here, you see? And in this ashtray, there is some soil, contaminated soil, radioactive soil. And by a, a process called induction, uh, the radioactive soil is decaying. That means that the, the atoms are decaying, and by decaying, the atoms make some noise. And the noise is makes a kind of concert. But what you can see on this stage, there is nobody. There is only the musical instruments, the mic, the mics and, and the dosimeters and the radioactive soil. So the main has disappeared from the stage. 
and this is this looks like John Cage. There is a kind of silence. And if you want to uh, listen, it, you see, you have only this uh, radio protective suit. This is the only. Not this is not a human being, but this is the only human shape you have on the stage. And if you want to listen a little bit to this, this is a sound, the radioactive sound of some uh, particles decaying. And you have, I think, uh, 45 minutes of this. This is a very exhausting uh, concert. So I, I cut it. <laughs> Thank you very much. I just want to say to my students, because I know some of them have classes afterwards, we are supposed to finish our seminar at, at one past, at 15 past one, that they can, of course, leave the conversation whenever they need to, uh, that I'm not keeping them off stage, <laughs> that they, of course, can leave. Um, I could take some other questions. If there are other questions, I, I can see that uh, there are people, in fact, working on your on your works who are here today. So maybe they have precise questions they would like to ask. Um, yeah. Okay. Yes, Anna has a question. Um, just one moment. I'm going to. Sorry about that. No, thank. Uh, <laughs> um, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation, and it's great to see you again today. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit just about the impact of some of this work on cultural conversations, both in France and in Japan, if you're following um, that kind of thing, like how much sort of we, we discussed a little bit about the political impact, but um, do you have a sense of sort of the cultural conversations, if that's changing at least maybe in the French mm -hmm. context in particular. So your question is about the cultural conversation between French and Japanese artists or the political connections? I guess that, sorry, the question wasn't very clear. The, I'm thinking about um, the impact of the Fuku art around the Fukushima disaster more broadly, sort of our, um, Okay. What's the cultural conversation around that in France, if these uh, French this, artists are yes. interested in it? This is a little bit complicated because, as you know, um, France, uh, as I said before, France has a lot of nuclear plants. And France is very, very efficient for the nuclear power. Um, I remember in 2011, at the moment of Fukushima, uh, I had a discussion with the French ambassador in the French embassy uh, in Tokyo. And he told me, you know, uh, in France, uh, we don't have a lot of uh, in, uh, international products. We have uh, the fashion, Christian Dior, Yves Saint Laurent, and so on, Chanel, and so on. We have the French language, uh, and we have the nuclear. These are uh, our three pillars. So what does it mean? That means that uh, when there was this disaster in Fukushima, the French government, of course, uh, offered uh, um, uh, help to the Japanese government, not only the French, but the American too, but the French government, especially uh, the French uh, enterprise, uh, French firm like Areva offered uh, to help the Japanese people to deal with the disaster. And the, the economic and industrial connection between the Japanese atomic power and the French atomic power is very, very strong. Even after, under the François Hollande presidency, François Hollande is a socialist, you know, left wing, uh, the, the, the French government has helped a lot to maintain the industry, the atomic industry in Japan. So the connection, the economic connection is very, very strong, very powerful, and it generates a lot of money. And this is for the economical, the economic side. And the artists, on the contrary, they are trying to have what you call a cultural conversation, but also a cultural collaboration between French and Japanese artists 
and not only uh, in visual arts, but in architecture and so on. So there is a kind of gap. And I would say that uh, the artists are really, the French artists and the Japanese artists, are the last people to, to believe that we can live in a nuclear free world. So uh, there is really, uh, this is really something complicated. And, but the French and the Japanese artists, I think they are in the same situation. They are dealing with a government that is pro-nuclear and they are trying to make people aware of the risk and they are trying to inform people and to help people who has been stuck by the nuclear disaster. So you have this strange situation where the, the artists are working uh, for the people who have been uh, stuck by the nuclear disaster, but they are, their own government uh, is pro-nuclear. That means that when you try to have cultural action, cultural conversations, you must try to do it to do this without the help of your own government. That means that you must find some new ways of funding. For example, uh, we have this problem every, every time. Uh, art, French artists, Japanese artists have the same problem. They, they cannot rely on the, the cultural uh, help, the financial help of the French government or the Japanese government. They, but they can rely on the, on the financial help of the cultural services, for example. So this is a very mixed situation. And this is a, a kind of schizophrenia in France and in Japan, where you have some people who are working against the nuclear industry and which, uh, you need some money for that. And so the, the, the answer of the embassies, for example, uh, is very mixed every time. I don't know if I clearly answered your question, but the, the fact is that the, the cultural conversation doesn't, there is no problem for the cultural conversation between Japanese artists and French artists. The problem is coming from the financial side. You must find money to, to fund projects, artistic projects. And then that is the reason why the young Japanese artists, for example, they have found some alternative ways of funding. And nowadays, uh, people like Chimpom, for example, or Arai Takashi, they are doing a lot of uh, self-funding or crowdfunding, not self-funding, crowdfunding or green funding to try to uh, get some money, not from the government side, but from the internet, from the social networks and so on. Great, thank you. Uh, I have uh, one very interesting question from Chloe Kashmarek, and I would like her to maybe just ask a question herself, because there are not that many of us left. So if she can, sure, I can. I can just um, I can just read what I wrote um, if you'd like. Um, I thank you so much for for the talk. It was really um, it was really interesting, especially in relation to um, your the the book that you wrote a while back called Fukushima Resident Disaster. But my question is not related to that. Um, it's related to your, your point about materiality and the collaboration between art and science. Um, and I was wondering, um, so I saw a link with a body of work that I'm familiar with more in the American context um, in the process of using film to collect traces of radioactivity. Um, I'm thinking of um, this series by Keith Callan and Chandra McCormick titled Right to Return, which uh, it's a very... the First, the images are very similar, and, and I think there's something quite, um, uh, I mean, it, 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 it addresses sort of, it works on the same possibilities for film, at least it reflects on the same uh, possibilities for analog film. Um, so basically, Right to Return is, is a series born out of the damages done by Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. Um, and it's a collection of their negative that got damaged in their own house uh, by the water flooding. Um, and um, some the basically the negatives become very colorful and abstract and they do see those negatives as um 
a reason for optimism, I think. They do see the color explosion as, as something positive for the future. Um, and I was wondering, um, sort of establishing this connection and seeing that there are similar processes being used by, by the, art, the four artists that you mentioned and, and those people who are in a completely different side of the world. If you could please elaborate on the function of materiality or art focused on the material dimension of images in resisting maybe addressing catastrophes and resisting the paradigm of invisibility that you have presented at the end. Um, I just, yeah, it seems that there, there's a tension, especially in the example of the film example that you chose with the invisible man between the material and the invisible. And so. Mm. Oh, okay. This is a very interesting and very difficult question. I don't know the right to return. I, I don't know this, uh, this project and uh, but what I can say is uh, the collaboration between art and science. I talked in, in, uh, in my talk, I, I talked about the potential collaboration. That means that, for example, I, uh, Marc Palin and Hélène Lucien, I asked them the question and I asked, I asked them uh, because they have this kind of what they call chrono radiograms, and you can see if uh, if a negative film has been exposed to radioactivity uh, in certain places, you can see if it has been uh, very radioactive, a little bit radioactive, and so on. And and in Shim Shim in Takeda Shimpei's works too. So I asked Marc Palin and Hélène Lucien and you can read it in the book, I, I asked them, but you know, uh, this could be very, very effective uh, for representing radioactivity. Because when I was working, for example, in the, in the Tohoku, in this radioactive zone, uh, one problem is to make people aware of the dangers. Uh, for example, for the medical diagnosis, or for example, for some hotspots. And the problem is not only to measure, the problem is to visualize. I don't know if you have seen um, a very, very, very interesting movie uh, from uh, uh, Michael Madsen, I think. It is called Into Eternity. And Into Eternity is, um, the a document about Onkalo. Onkalo is um, in Finland and it's a kind of cave. It's under the ground. It's a radioactive waste uh, um, space. And the problem is, uh, if you see this movie, you, you can understand the problem is not only to store the radioactive waste, but to make people aware there is a radioactive place here. So you are going to use some symbols. For example, you are going to use the famous radioactive symbol, and this means danger. So this is a symbol. This is not material. But this symbol is going, the, the meaning of this symbol is quite obvious for us. But in 10,000 years, or even in 1,000 years, uh, perhaps the meaning will not be so obvious for the next generations. If you write something, you, if you write danger, nuclear, and so on, in English, for example, uh, now everybody understands. But in 1,000 1, years, or 10,000 years, or 100,000 years, who will understand English? Nobody knows. The, this, the movie of Michael Madsen, Into Eternity, is asking this kind of uh, questions, is this kind of uh, problems. So uh, the, the, the problem of uh, materiality, how to materialize this kind of uh, of problems, it, it, it's a real huge problem, you know. I don't know if I and if I answered your question, but well, that would be my my answer for the moment. Thank you. To continue on that, I think it's a very interesting question because I could, you know, I I you send me the book, so I had time to look at it a bit, and 
I could see some recurrences in some of the dispositives that were used. And this idea that the, the film, you know, the, la pellicule, can show by impression with no direct real intervention of the artist, but just by letting it in the space can materialize suddenly because the radioactivity is the agent, um, is something that you know, repeats itself in a lot of the dispositives that are chosen by those artists. And the other one is uh, intervent interventionist form of act, you know, uh, artist performance. They are more like, you know, uh, performance that are films. Uh, but I think it's quite interesting that you have those two kind of opposite way to deal uh, with, uh, with, um, with the apparatus, with the aesthetic apparatus. On one hand, it's an intervention. On the other hand, you minimize uh, the, the role of the artist as an agent, but what becomes the agent is the radioactivity itself, and you find material ways to show its impression. Uh, but I just wanted to know if you had something to, to, to say more about that, because I was also thinking of this film that has been made, um, I have it somewhere in my office, by those French people who just put a camera. It's like just a, the camera within the, uh, the Fukushima Daiichi, just filming it. And they have just edited the images, which are just still images, just to show what it looks like inside. But there is no real human intervention. It's like the mechanic recording of the camera, which can in a way be similar to the imprint of the radioactivity traces onto some materials. Yes, and that's, very, that's a very interesting point because one thing I didn't mention about the Fukushima's artist, is a famous and very problematic exhibition. Uh, the name is Don't Follow the Wind. Uh, a bunch of Japanese artists has organized an exhibition in the Forbidden Zone. Uh, and of course, this exhibition is uh, named uh, Don't Follow the Wind. And of course, you cannot go in this exhibition you cannot see the works. The works are there. Uh, the works are in the um, in the abandoned houses mm -hmm. in the forbidden zone. So uh, nobody can see these works. So what is an art where nobody can see what is exposed, what is exhibited? And this is a very interesting question because when you go to a museum, when you go to a, an exhibition, uh, you don't only go to see the work of art. You go to see the work of art, and then you are talking with some people, with your friends, with your relatives, with an, even some people you don't know, and you're talking about the thing you are, you are seeing in the museum or in the exhibition. That means that the visual art is made and it generates some words and some communication and some connections between human beings. That is the way we, we see a work of art in a museum, in a flat, in an apartment, anywhere. But in the case of the Forbidden Zone, you, this connection is broken. That means that you have a work of art somewhere, it exists, but you don't have any spectators. And so you don't, you cannot talk, even you cannot talk about it. It's a kind of ghost art, you know? And uh, it's like the music concert that I show. That means there, are, there is nobody here. And th I think the, the text of the philosopher in the book, uh, Dans l'œil du désastre, there is a French philosopher, Hervé Couchot. He, he deals with these issues. What is an art who uh, cannot be seen by anyone? And this is, a, a, this is not only an intellectual uh, question, you know? This is a real question and a real issue for us. Thank you very much. It's been nearly two hours, so I think we have to let you go because and get some sleep because I'm, I'm really aware it's really... What time is it in Tokyo right now? Uh, what time is it? 
time to sleep. <laughs> it's time to sleep. It's four o'clock, almost four yeah, o'clock. So you really have to go to sleep. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mikael. Thank you very much. Thank and you. Before you all go, I just wanted to say that you could find Michael again in conversation with Martin Monroe on March 25th. We're organizing uh, a discussion on translation. Uh, Martin Monroe is the director of the Winthrop Trap King Institute in Florida at Florida State University. Uh, has also translated Michael, um, Michael's books uh, Over the Sea, I think it's been translating as Over the Seas of Memory, Memoir d'Outre-mer. Um, and so the title of that event would be translating on the fault line. And I think it's going to be also quite, quite interesting. And for some of you, uh, brave you, uh, I might see you again tomorrow because uh, the center is organizing a discussion on cosmopolitics of hospitality with Ashin Mende and Felwin Sa. 